one is the Young Merchant, where we're interviewing other entrepreneurs and go-getters in our communities. Uh, we're looking to create inspiring content for you guys to motivate you guys and give you guys helpful tips so that maybe one day you guys can be entrepreneurs yourself. Today, I'm super excited for this interview. I'm with somebody I personally have known for a long time. Um, but I'm here today with Sophia Andrews. Her family and I go way back, but she's doing wonderful things. She's the founder of a nonprofit called Nagoma. I hope I'm saying the name right, Kenya. Yeah. <laughs> um, their goal is to provide access to children in Kenya, um, the arts, whether that's music, painting, dancing, all, all the types and aspects of art. Um, so she's still in college, which is it's crazy that she's a founder of a nonprofit at her age. Um, and it's had a lot of success, which I, I really want to get into. But Sophia, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. So happy to be here. Absolutely. So first off, um, how's your new year starting? How's it going? How did last year end? Um, what's going on? Yeah, so this year has been really good so far. Um, I'm back at university, starting things up again with in-person classes. Um, last year, I think, ended on a pretty good note. Um, I was able to take the semester off and to move to Kenya for a few months to work with my organization and be there in person with the team and everyone. So I think it was just a really much needed break after like the year that I had had with classes and COVID and everything. So I would say it ended on a really good note and it was great to be back there for a few months and be with everyone. So it's going to be back in, in DC and at university, but I had a really good end of 2021. It is crazy to hear. It's cool because we can connect in a sense of travel. Uh, mm. I think my trip to Alaska is crazy. To the fact that you, I think you went to Kenya like 14 or something and you've yeah. been back more than one time. So yep. talk about that. How is, um, we're both from Delaware. How has that changed your life and how you looked at things going mm. out of your comfort zone? Yeah, for sure. And I definitely think like coming from America, like our bubble, it's it tends to be a little bit small and we tend to think like America can be the world. So, yeah, traveling to Kenya at 14, I think um, I guess it's kind of cliche to say, but it was very life changing. Like that trip really did change the trajectory of my future. And it's why I do what I do now, what I study, what I study now. So, um, yeah, I got to travel to Kenya when I was 14. Uh, there was a local group. Um, my youth group at the time was traveling and I had heard about the children's home. I was sponsoring a little girl there and I was like, okay, great. Like, this sounds really cool. I want to go on this trip. Immediately, my dad was like, yeah, that's not happening. Like, you're 14. You've never been out the country without us. Like, that's not happening. And my mom's the adventurous one. She's like, you have to go. So um, eventually they agreed to let me go. And I'm really glad they did because, you know, I got to meet the little girl. I sponsored at the home, got to meet the staff, get to know the kids. And that's where I taught. I got to teach a ballet class one of the days. And I found out that the kids really liked it and they really love dance and music and the arts, which are all the things that I love. So that's really how that initial trip went for me and kind of kicked off what my organization is today. So what made you, because um, I was looking into how you came back, you know, you told your mom that, you know, this you know, you want to start an organization over there, potentially a performance arts school over there. What, what was that what it was with just seeing the kids doing it? Was it, you know, you teaching it, practicing what you learned? What was it that made you ultimately decide to form the foundation? Yeah, I think what allowed me to form the foundation was started prior to me even ever getting to Kenya. Growing up, I was involved in a lot of performance arts groups, but they were really volunteer based and focused. Um, one in particular was called the Imagination Players. And we would go out into the community and use dance and music and the arts to go to like nursing homes and to go to hospitals and just to put a smile on people's faces using music and using dance. And so I had that, I was in that since I was seven years old. And so I kind of had that foundation. And so I'd always been like, how can I combine this like love of dance and but also like wanting to help people and to make a difference in my mind and my like 12 13 year old mind at the time I was like that's impossible but when I got to Kenya and I saw like okay these kids really love this and they don't necessarily have a creative outlet how can I kind of use what I'm doing now and use that to help them with like finding a creative outlet and being able to express themselves so after that initial trip I came home and I just told my parents like I want to go back I want to you know do more and we partnered with the children's home and we launched a fundraiser for ballet or for school supplies um, and we ended up like tripling the amount of money we needed to raise within like 24 hours and that's when I realized okay like maybe we actually have something that people can get behind and support so the next year I went back with my mom and we launched uh, a two-week long dance camp and also uh, a piece through the art series with two artists from my brother's art college that came along with us so it really sprouted from that initial trip 
at 14 of like, I've always had that desire and that passion to like want to do more and want to do things that are bigger than myself. And so having dance and using ballet as the avenue was kind of my way into that. That is like, I, I think it's just a crazy story. I mean, not yeah. only did you go some, you know, go somewhere where most people have never, you know, they don't only know what they do on TV. They just couldn't fathom, you know, yeah. getting out of the but then to enjoy it up there, come back, go multiple times, and then also want to help people that you probably were just learning about. That you, yeah. I'm sure you learned a little bit before you went, but you didn't really grasp, you know, their culture, their, you know, their people, you know, simple yeah. stuff they eat, you know, um, just different stuff like that. And then to mm-hmm. come back and, you know, create an organization that really helps. So I think that's really like, it's one empowerment, and two, it's very, I think it's very different. It's really unique. Most people that go the entrepreneur route, um, they go for profit. They, you know, they want to sell, you know, whether it's a product or clothes or whatever. Um, so I think it's very unique and very powerful. You should be proud that you, you, know, you did an organization, a nonprofit that's really helping people. So mm-hmm. uh, for people that maybe have like a similar desire, maybe it's not arts, maybe it's not in Kenya, it's somewhere else, it's a different aspect, but they have the same passion and want to help somebody. Mm-hmm. Um, can you share what kind of like your experience was setting up a nonprofit? Yeah. um, And that's something too that I always like try to share and always try to say when I get to kind of talk about what I do is for me, it was dance, but for you, it could be something completely different. But um, I love when I hear that people are using whatever it is they're passionate about, whatever, you know, that makes them happy, what they wake up and think about and utilizing that sort of as a catalyst for change making. So um, I just will like say that out there, like it literally can be whatever it is that you're passionate about, but you can use that, you can use STEM, you can use music, you can use uh, really whatever you like and use that to make a difference. But um, I think for me um, in the beginning process, one of the biggest things I wanted to make sure first and something that I've learned a lot more over the years was before going into this community and doing these things that I thought were gonna help make a change to actually listen Um, And to take a step back and see like, what is it? What are the needs first? Like, I didn't want to just as an American, as a Westerner, go into this community and say, well, this is how we do it in America. So this is how we're doing it here. Like, that's not how change happens at all. You have to actively listen to people. And so like with the first fundraiser, you know, we listened, we said, what were your needs? What can I help with? Um, And even to this day, like everyone, like a good chunk of our team, they're in Kenya, they're on the grounds, they actively are from the community and they live there because that to me is so important that their voices are heard at every aspect, every part of the part of Ngoma, Kenya. Um, But really how we got our start was with that initial fundraiser. But my mom was a really big help in all the logistical stuff because I just turned 15. Um, I think I was like a sophomore in high school. So, you know, still in school, still figuring things out. And so um, she was really helpful with that and trying to figure out um, kind of what goes into becoming a 501c3 nonprofit and registering it with the state and what that looks like internationally because we're currently in the process of getting nonprofit status in Kenya. We only have it in the States. And so um, I think a big part of it was uh, a lot of research, um, a lot of asking questions. I think that's something that I always say is like, don't be afraid to like, go to someone who's a CEO of a nonprofit or an executive director and kind of ask them how they got their start. Like, what did you do? Because that's really the only way we learn is when we talk to other people and we have those conversations. And so um, it was a lot of like logistical things that like my mom was able to help with. And even to to this day, you know, she's on the board of the organization and she's really helpful when it comes to all the logistical nonprofit-y side of things. But I think um, just like a big part of it is doing the research. I read a lot of books about nonprofits. I read a lot of books about by founders of nonprofits because I'm always trying to learn and see, you know, how do they get to where they are and how can I get to that point and go even further. So um, I think making sure you're putting in the time and the work, but also researching and educating yourself is going to be a big part of starting off in that process. Gosh, yeah, I I feel like it just like a lot of businesses are easy to start, but mm-hmm. not to no, know. Like I, I, I think growing up, we're taught that mm-hmm. not necessarily, you know, verbally taught, but just by how, you know, society teaches, whether it's TV, our peers, you know, you don't see people around you starting nonprofits or businesses. Um, you don't know anybody that's done it. You just see the guy pull up on a cool car and that's, you know, he's a millionaire yep. or you hear Red Cross and there's such a big organization. You don't, you don't understand how nonprofit is created. Um, but a lot of these things are kind of, I want to say easy, but they're doable. It's not always money. It's not always being famous. And people just need, you know, access to these things. Same thing for what you're doing with performing arts. Um, 
kids might, how would you know if you want to become a professional, you know, dancer, if you want to, you want to, you know, paint and go to Europe and, you know, and have your collection in a gallery or something, or if you want to be the next teacher uh, for English or something, your community, how do you know these things if you're not, you know, introduced to them and you yeah. see them today? So um, how have, did you have any mentors, anybody specifically that you kind of feel like you were influenced a lot about as far as having a nonprofit? Yes, I would say um, I'm really fortunate, really blessed to have some like really, really great mentors um, in my life. And well, for starters, I'd say like with my parents, both of my parents are entrepreneurs. And so I think I kind of grew up seeing that, you know, my dad runs his own business. My mom's had multiple businesses. And so I think I grew up in a household where my parents were always, you know, their own boss and their own CEOs. And so I think that first and foremost uh, really influenced me into like, okay, like I want to do my own thing. Like I, how can I create my own thing? Kind of how my parents have always worked together and created things and done things on their own. So they've always kind of been that source of inspiration. Um, but out Outside of them, um, I have some really great mentors. Um, one who's like an older sister, Kanita Benson. She also runs an organization in Kenya. We actually met through social media, um, found out that we like lived. And it's one of those things where you're like not supposed to like talk to people on Instagram. It's like safety and all that, but um, ended up working out really well. And she's, you know, like my older sister. Um, I'm going to her wedding next year. And we able actually got to travel to Kenya together my senior year of high school because she has a nonprofit that works with refugee girls there. And so that ended up being such a cool connection. I have other mentors that do a lot of social entrepreneurship work. And so I'm just really thankful that, you know, I was growing up able to take the initiative to find people, but also that I was able to be introduced to people, whether it's my parents, colleagues, uh, their mentees, people that they know. Um, but yeah, I always, I'm wholeheartedly believe in surrounding yourself with kind of the future that you want to see. And my dad always says, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And I think that that's a really, really powerful quote. And I heard it a lot growing up but now that I'm older, I see what he means by that. Like who are, who's in your circle? Who are the people that you're talking to, that you're listening to? Because, you know, they're the ones that are really going to have an impact on your future and where you go and your goals um, and things like that. So I, I really love like the circle uh, that I have around me and especially the mentors and the people, the people that are much older than me that have made mistakes when they're my age that can give me advice because it's really great in those times when I need to go to them and talk to them. Yeah, I think it's good as you touched on that because um, that's why it's important for me, like mm -hmm. we were talking earlier about my kid, that's important for me to show entrepreneurship. I don't mm -hmm. care about the work or something like that, but I think it's good to have people around because you, again, like you wouldn't just, you would never um, approach that or think it's an option if you never see it. Exactly. Um, and I, I totally am a big advocate for like who's in your circle. Um, I think a lot of people take that phrase in you're limited by who you're around. It's not that it's that. It's we're easily influenced as people. And I mean, there's several things. I mean, when you're easily influenced, you know, if you're around a bunch of people that are not doing anything, not that you're not going to do anything, but you might not be being motivated to do something. You know, if you're around a bunch of people, I used to work for a car dealership and everybody at my job had a truck. Mm. I never wanted a truck a day in my life. And in a month I had a truck. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah and, I, and like that's an example. Like I, I didn't, they didn't tell me to get a truck, but you just, if, you know, all seven other salespeople have a truck, and you see them every day, and you think they're, you know, they explain what, you know, what everything is. Next thing you know, something psychologically in my head was like, I need a truck. Yeah, um, and I, I think that's kind of how we work as people sometimes. So I, I think it's very powerful. You can be around. Um, I don't, I don't think it's wrong being around. People. You don't have to leave everybody you know and stuff like yeah. that. But I think it's good to be around people that are older than you or people that are doing what you want to do or people that maybe don't necessarily think like you, but they're doing something, mm -hmm. you know, if you're doing a nonprofit, maybe the person, your friend is doing it for profit. Maybe somebody does work for a company, but they work 20 years and they're now they're high up. Maybe somebody um, is retired and they help in their community, whatever the case is, just exposing yourself to people that are doing different things that can elevate how you think, um, I think is very important. Yes. Um, let's talk about your nonprofit. I, I really want to get into that. Um, so some stats that I kind of saw that I was just like, I don't understand. So you have affected 300 people. I don't know. Is that, that was, I don't know when I was published, but I saw that on there. So I thought yeah. that was crazy. Um, I saw three over 3,000 meals. So that was crazy. And then I also saw over $15,000 of donations already too. 
So it, it, it's, I, I don't know, I just, I'm so proud of you personally. I know it's oh. not usually how you interview go, but yeah. I think it's crazy. So tell me how, how's business been? I should say, how's the organization doing? Yeah, no, first of all, thank you. I do appreciate that. Um, Actually, yeah, it's those were like our like pre COVID stats. So we actually to like go into our website and and update that and fix that. But I'd say things are going really well. I know with a lot of like, I have a lot of young friends and a lot of people that are in the social entrepreneurship space and run organizations and have had to adapt during COVID. But I think how we were able to adapt during COVID really, ooh, I'm so sorry. I'm getting a. You're good. You're good. Um, But during the pandemic, we really had to adapt and shift um, like sort of the focus of the organization. But honestly, I think it's put us on such um, a different path and it's really helped align us to kind of where I've been wanting to see the organization go. Um, And it's kind of it's wild looking back at how when I started this organization, it was just ballet. It was just me teaching ballet classes and that was the premise of it. But now it's grown into so much more where we focus on arts education, youth empowerment and girls rights in Kenya. And we use arts as a catalyst for that. So we have art classes that we go out into Nairobi. Um, We work with multiple schools, churches, children's homes to bring art classes to their kids every week. Uh, We do an art therapy centered classes because a lot of the kids, we work at a rescue center and a lot of the kids there have been through a lot of trauma and abandonment. And so we kind of want to use the arts as a way for them to express themselves. Um, We also have a program called Stand By Her, which uh, is a period poverty program where we talk to girls about health and hygiene and menstruation. And then at the end of that, we do a big pad distribution. Um, So we just, what we really wanted to do, like I said earlier, was just finding ways that there have been needs in the community and how we can sort of fill those gaps and, and fix those needs. And for me, nine times out of 10, that's coming from the team members in the community. I'm not the one saying, hey, let's do this. I'm sitting them down, having conversations with them and saying, hey, what do you need? What do you see happening in your community? And how can I rally behind you? How can Ngoma Kenya rally behind you and help you make a difference in your community? So a lot of our projects were by specific team members because they were like, okay, I see this happening in my community. I know down the street, there's people that haven't eaten in three days during COVID. So how can we start a feeding program and go out and deliver or food to single mothers and mothers with kids with disabilities who can't work. And so um, it's just filling in those little needs and trying to figure out what my role and all of it is. And so um, I think it's been really cool. I've gotten to meet a lot of cool people. I've gotten to travel to Kenya. I think almost like I've kind of lost count, but it's been almost like 10 times now that I think I've been back and forth. I try to go twice a year, um, but it's been really cool to just see it grow from this really small thing. And also what we have planned for the next five, 10 years, we're building a community center so that we can house our art, our music, our dance classes, as well as uh, do a lot of community outreach. We want to have a food pantry. We want to have our own feeding program. We want to bring dance teachers in so they can teach and do after school programs with the kids. And so what I think a big part of it is what are the issues we see and what do we want to target? Um, And we focus a lot on like the UN social development goals. And we are looking at no poverty and um, like a holistic education and uh, girls' rights and equality. And so what are those systemic issues and how can we plug in and fix that? Because we know there's high rates of child abandonment. So it's how can we fix that? How can we make sure, you know, teen mothers are, you know, getting what they need for their children and that they don't have to abandon them? And how can we make sure we're breaking the cycle of poverty in the slum areas and in different communities? How can we empower the young people because they are the highest population in Kenya, but you can't get a job if you don't have a high school degree or if you don't have a college degree, but you can't go to college if you don't have a good high school diploma. So it's how can we sort of break some of these issues so that way um, it helps society as a whole, but we're empowering young people because I know young people, you know, we're, we're the next generation and we're the future, but it's important that we're poured into right now and that, you know, that young people know that they're capable of so much more. And so um, even though like we, we're, um, we're showcased as just like an arts or education organization, we do so much more and our goals go a little bit deeper than just ballet classes. It's how can we kind of break down some of these systemic issues so that way we start to build better communities, not just in Kenya, but as we expand all over Africa as well. Yeah, I think, I think it's smart to one, just from an entrepreneur's perspective too, is how can like, even though you're not profit, I think you, and we were explaining how you still have to run it as a business, you know, cause you mm-hmm. want it to 
eat. So whether it's about making money or it's about helping other people, whatever the goal is, you have to have a business mindset. Mm -hmm. I think it's good how you're showing, um, you know, the importance of having a wide range too. Um, mm -hmm. You know, start out this way, you know, with just the arts and all of a sudden it's like, I'm over here, I'm over here. We're helping out with meals. We're helping out with education. We're helping out with uh, mentorship. Um, so I, I think that's an important lesson for people, you know, is to make sure you see what your audience needs and then start from there. You're not changing your mission. Your mission is still the same, um, mm -hmm. but you're just giving you know, like your audience and the people that you, you know, you work for um, almost like an outlet for them to express what they need. And it almost makes your job easier because you know mm -hmm. what they need. Exactly. So I think that's very empowering. Um, now, as far as people, viewers, what can they do? How do we get involved? How do we help the nonprofit? You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So I'm really excited because as it's grown, we've been able to uh, expand sort of how people can interact and involve with the organization. Obviously, uh, we're on all social media, so that's the easiest way to support. It's just at Ngoma Kenya, N-G-O-M-A-K-E-N-Y-A on all social platforms. And um, it's a little bit easier if you're living in Kenya to get involved with us because we have volunteer opportunities, um, multiple we're actually hiring right now, bringing on some new staff members, art teachers, things like that. But we're building out a few programs that are connecting young people in the States with the young people in our programs in Kenya. So I would just say, be on the lookout for that because that's something that's launching later this year that I'm really excited about because I really want to start to bridge that gap. I think, you know, my sister came home from like a class once with a little hut on a like paper plate that she made. And she was like, yeah, we learned about Africa today and we made these huts, but she was like, I've gotten to travel with you to Kenya and I didn't see a single hut. And I'm like, exactly, because the rest of the world, how we perceive Kenya, how we perceive Africa is completely different than how it actually is. There's so much wealth in the country. And I think we're only ever shown the poverty from the Western point of view. So I want to find ways that, you know, we're learning the truth about other countries and other parts of the world. And like I said earlier, that bubble, it starts to break that bubble and it starts to expand, you know, our, our worldview and like what we see in the world and know about the world. So um, yeah, be on the lookout for that because I'm really excited to find ways to connect, uh, you know, people that want to get involved in the States to the team we have in Kenya. Uh, well, I personally will always be on the lookout for that, but definitely we'll have the social tag down below. I um, also saw the website, we'll have a link for that below as well. Um, I, I just really appreciate this interview and your time and this story. Uh, I can't wait to see everything that the nonprofit does. Um, and also just see the lives that you guys impact. I do see a lot of the stories on Instagram and stuff. So it, I, I like the content you guys have. So we can kind of see what's going on. Because like you said, we're, we're over here. So I don't, I don't get to see it. I don't yeah. get to be there. But I, I, love, I love that about social media. I can feel a part of it and see you know, what's happening. Exactly. Um, what would be your, um, I always ask everybody, what would be your, your, I would say the biggest advice that you feel like has impacted your life? Ooh, the biggest piece of advice. That's a great question. I love that question. Um, I would say one of the best piece of, pieces of advice that I've ever gotten um, is to not be afraid, but, or to not, not, it's like weird how it was phrased, but like, <laughs> It's not like, cause I know for me, I, even though I don't always come across as it, I tend to be like really nervous in terms of like public speaking or like doing whatever, like I get the worst anxiety or nerves, but to not let that stop you from what it is that you want to do. Like it's very cliche, but it's often like you have to be yourself and you can't let other people's opinions and um, what other people might or might not be thinking or saying about you hinder you from what you want to do and what you want to put out into the world. So I think just um, being told to always be yourself, but to, to not be afraid to let the little things stop you because you never know how far that can take you. And I've kind of seen that evident throughout my life and throughout this sort of change making journey of like times when I was younger and I was like, oh, like, I don't want to go to that meeting. It's going to be all adults. They're not going to care what I have to say, but then doing it and seeing the impact that comes out of it. So uh, just constantly reminding myself that, you know, it's okay to be afraid. It's okay to get nerves, but that can't stop you from the work that you're doing because it's such important work. So it's probably one of the best pieces of advice I've gotten. I've been a very, very big advocate of, I want to say embracing fear, mm -hmm. but knowing, knowing that it's going to happen. A lot of people are trying to not be afraid of something. There's nothing wrong with being afraid. Exactly. Um, just knowing how you react to it when you're in that situation is very key. If you if you let fear stop you, you mm -hmm. won't conquer. 
you want, but if you kind of try to push through it, you know, not ignore it, but acknowledge it and then, you know, push forward. Um, a lot of people would be surprised what they can do. So I like that. I love that. You said not ignore it, but acknowledge it. That needs to be like on shirts. <laughs> I love that. That's that's really good. <laughs> yes. maybe, maybe you come. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your time so much today. I, I appreciate everybody tuning in today to the Young Merchant and watching another great interview. Um, this will be on YouTube. We'll have an article on this as well. But definitely check out Nagoma, Kenya. Um, nonprofit is doing amazing things and they're growing really fast and they're impacting a lot of people. So um, we thank you for tuning in. Until next time.